I believe supply chain matters. I believe it saves the world. The lifeblood of our business models is people. How do we balance everything we do, making sure that product's available for every consumer when they need it, and how do we balance the cost, the cash, the inventory to do that has been a battle that we've been working through for a long time. And that's what's exciting me is, is that can we think about our supply chain the way we use our phone, the way our kids use the internet, and everything is much more available. I think the technology is there. Sometimes we have blinders that prevent us from thinking about it this way. This is a, an actual 3D solid model of a patient's heart. This is a pediatric heart made for a specific patient uh, in Phoenix Children's Hospital about five miles from here. There okay. is a convergence going on of technology. Mm -hmm. When you build up the capability of interdependency, mm -hmm. it's going to be very, very powerful to whatever business end results that you have. Companies are now going to be less and less and less on the inventory. They're going to be on-demand manufacturing. They're going to assemble the supply chain ecosystems on the fly. And, and, and I think that's the thing that's going to be exciting to watch over the next you know, five years. It's where we take all the waste uh, from the 359 Ralphs and Food for Less stores in Southern California and we bring it back to the distribution center and we put it through a process um, in, and into an anaerobic digester and the gas that comes off of that we use to actually power the boiler that they use at the creamery on site so we probably have the cleanest ice cream around um, but it also produces 20 percent of the electrical needs for the campus there in, in Compton. I believe supply chain is a part of all businesses and I know you do too and that's why you're here. Ladies and gentlemen please welcome to the stage Laura Sassiri. Why we're here. <laughs> Supply chain saves the world. I think it builds economies. And I think each of you have had a piece of this journey of putting together this program. And I'd like to start with a story. I've been an industry analyst for over a decade, really targeting how have we done on the use of technology and driving process improvement and I wanted to write a book on the 30th anniversary of supply chain management. I had heard at conference after conference about how we'd save money, we'd improved inventory, we'd improved asset utilization, and I wanted to write the story of how we had driven success. But as I sat at my kitchen table to write the book, what I found was that most companies weren't making improvement. In fact, what I found was we were going backwards in often cases. Dow Chemicals at the same place that they were in 2000 and 2013. Flextronics is at the same place. So I wrote this book, Bricks Matter, and it became a history book. It wasn't the celebratory book that I wanted to write. Because I found that nine out of 10 companies are stuck at the intersection of operating margin and inventory turns. We've improved revenue per employee, but we haven't driven it into operating margin. And what I want to do is help you to set the stage, to really recognize that we're stuck, and that we need to embrace new mental models. It starts here. And this program is designed to start that process. And it's my hope that you can talk to all the colleagues in the room so that you can really start to shape new mental models. Because when we ask supply chain leaders about the metaphors that describe their supply chain, they talk about it's traditional. They talk about that it's tightly controlled. But it doesn't match what they want of agile and responsive. Supply chains react, but they don't sense. New forms of analytics could allow us to sense. But the problem is right here. It's with our mental model. And as we think about supply chains and we think about the impact on the organization, it isn't just about good old fashioned supply. No, it's about how do we really manage global operations and the risk associated with demand. Most of our organizations have built supply chains, but end-to-end -end supply chains are in less than 5% of companies. And the opportunity is great. Yesterday, we published the top 15 supply chains to admire. 
it's at the end of a two-year project. Those companies have both increased operating margin, inventory turns, and return on invested capital to a higher degree than their competitors, and they've driven supply chain improvement. They have a lower risk impact. And, you know, when I look at the companies that were able to do that, I have three learnings, and I want to share those with you this morning. The first one is you don't get there through building tight, integrated, vertical silos. The best companies don't have a focus on the best procurement and the best manufacturing and the best transportation, no. Instead, they're looking at end-to-end, -end, outside in, and how can they really take the waste between the functions and how can they get the functions to work together? That is not trivial because we've gone through a lot of mergers and acquisitions, and what I'm going to show you in the data is big companies are doing worse at the intersection of operating margin and inventory turns because their vertical silos are so big. The second thing I learned is this is a complex system with tight interrelationships between nonlinear relationships. And most people look at this data in spreadsheets. You can never get there looking at this data in spreadsheets. Instead, what we've got to do is we've got to raise the potential of the supply chain to manage the metrics holistically. So now let's take a minute. We've got a number of questions that we have in the deck, and we're going to ask you with your mobile phones to basically put in this URL, which will take you to a QRS site, which will allow you to give us some feedback about how you're doing on the management of metrics. Number one, do you think you manage metrics holistically, looking at inventory and operating margin, return on invested capital and growth together? Or do you try, but you've got constant distractions, change in business? Or do you manage it in isolation? Is it operating margin one day and inventory turns the next? Just take a minute and give us your feedback, and then we'll pull it up later in the presentation. So what was the promise? In 1982, when we built supply chain management, and it was the underpinning of the future economy, we said that we wanted it to be resilient and predictable that we wanted to drive this balanced portfolio. And we wanted to be able to deliver performance against the peer group. But let's take the average Joe. My new book, Metrics That Matter, actually focuses on this guy, the average Joe. This average Joe wants to drive improvement. And he's looking at inventory turns and operating margin and case fill rate. But he's in an organization like many of yours where there's trouble, right? His boss doesn't understand inventory turns. He's looking at inventory level or inventory dollars and doesn't really understand that we've got to design the supply chain. We've got to look at form and function of inventory. It's hard for him to get good case fill data in his organization because each of his divisions measures case fill differently and they overstate case fill. In fact, I find a 7 to 10 percent overstatement or bias in case fill data. And operating margin, he struggles to get data. And we actually see that in our research, while we've spent 1.7 percent of revenue on technology, only 8 percent of companies can get at cost data. And that is the story of Average Joe. So how does Average Joe bring his team together? And how does he build that? progress or potential on what we call the effective frontier, which is dealing with these metrics as a complex system together. How does he drive growth? Because the supply chain is an engine of growth. And how does he really work at the intersection of profitability and inventory cycles with rising complexity? Because many of our industries have seen a 50 to 60 percent downturn in growth. And in fact, Laura Tyson's going to talk about what's happening in geographic continents. I was in Europe last week, and they talked about, you know, the slowness in the Mediterranean region with growth. It's a struggle. And as growth subsides, we're struggling at this intersection. And complexity has risen in most organizations, and it's been unmanaged. 
And supply chain leaders have not been able to have the conversation at the boardroom about complexity and the long tail of the supply chain and product proliferation on this complex system. And I want to help you. So I'm bringing data to the market. We build a database of 20 years of supply chain financial ratios, and we're mining the data to look at how have the industry's done. And when you look at this data, and maybe you need your microscope because it's fine, but you can see that the pharmaceutical industry has the highest margin, but you're going to see that they've done the poorest in the supply chains to admire. There just hasn't been as much reason for them to move. But you're also going to see across all the industries, we've made a dramatic improvement on revenue per employee, but it has not translated into operating margin. What's happened is we have dramatically looked at the efficient supply chain, but not embraced the concepts of the effective supply chain to redesign outside in. And we have not built successful value networks. So most industries are stuck at the intersection of operating margin and inventory turns. And what do we do? We do a lot of projects. In fact, I had a client last week that had 5,000 projects a project here and a project there and a project here. And they thought project A plus project B plus project C would lead them to the path of gold. It doesn't. What we found is that companies will often make improvement at this intersection for one or two years, but the ability to sustain it requires leadership. It requires strong horizontal processes. It needs channel data. It needs different forms of analytics. Now, when a recession happens, the management team gets with religion, right? And you can see when we put all industries together, we pull up and we do better on operating margin and inventory turns. But what happens? We can't sustain it. And it matters to the balance sheet. When we looked at six years of market data on quarterly market cap data, and we did correlations on which metrics matter and correlate to balance sheet data, you can see that return on invested capital does much better than return on assets. But most companies in their functional silos are pushing a return on asset strategy. And it's throwing us out of balance. And we find that when manufacturing reports in a separate silo, we can't balance these metrics as well. When procurement reports in a separate silo, we can't balance these metrics as well. We've got to embrace it as a complex system. And that's what our mission has been. Because we want to help companies to get to the promise of how do we raise the potential of the supply chain, how do we build new economies, and how do we break the cycle. And I want to encourage all of you, if you're a first generation technology provider, it's changed and it's time to get ready for the third act. If you're a business leader and you're driving change in your organization, I want you to take this data and I want you to spark a new level of definition because we don't get there through functional silos. We don't get there through projects. We've got to get there through an end-to-end -end focus. And we've got to embrace that we can't just put in supposed best practices and believe that the path is going to be brilliant. Because most companies, when we look at time, and this is the work we've been doing, the basis of the supply chains we admire, are based upon the orbit chart. And the orbit chart looks at how have companies done over time, year after year, at the intersection of two metrics on the effective frontier. This is Walmart. Walmart is a supply chain leader. They've done one of the best jobs on Retail Link. But look at Walmart making a lot of improvement in inventory turns, not as much improvement in operating margin, and not going towards that top right-hand corner, right? Not one company in the retail sector made the cut on the supply chains to admire. Let's look at Apple, a different journey, very focused on margin, right? Again, a supply chain leader. Very few companies have the return on invested capital that Apple has but the metrics are going in one direction. Now let's look at Dow. Walmart 
and Apple are supply chain leaders. At least they're making some improvement, right? Dell is at the same place in 2013 that they were at 2000. And look at their journey. It's a journey of we're going to have operating margin here and we're going to have inventory turns there and we're constantly throwing the supply chain out of balance. This is real world. In fact, a lot of times companies ask me to come and talk at a board level because they've had a strategic consultant come in and tell them that they can cut inventory. We have two buffers in the supply chain, manufacturing and inventory. And as we have loaded up our factories and we have higher asset utilization, inventory becomes a really important buffer. And it isn't about inventory levels, it's about that form and function of inventory. And yes, you need technology to really get at that answer. And you need to change the dialogue. Because most companies are like that. Or Procter & Gamble, right? We think of Procter & Gamble as a leader. But Procter & Gamble has gone backwards on operating margin and return on invested capital. They became more singularly focused on inventory. Complexity rose in the system. They drove themselves out of balance. And then let's look at Mattel. A gnarly pattern at best that we'll ask Philippe to talk about. Most companies have very gnarly patterns. And then when we look at value chains, this is the consumer value chain, you find that each company is operating within its own pattern. But the promise of collaboration, of companies working together, about raising value chain performance together is still in front of us. It's a journey we're just starting. So we as an organization have been writing series of reports around each of the industries. And we'd be glad to do a financial analysis for you and your packets. You have a sheet that if you just turn in, we'll give you your analysis. Because we believe that supply chain excellence requires a closer look at performance and a look at improvement. And we use the orbit charts as the basis. And performance says, am I doing better than my peer group in these important metrics of operating margin and inventory turns and return on invested capital? And the way we came up with the supply chains to admire was we started with all publicly held companies. And we took out the companies that didn't have at least six companies to be in a peer group. And then we took out all the conglomerates, companies like GE and Honeywell, because it's hard to compare a conglomerate. And then we took out all the companies that had gone through major mergers and acquisitions, because how do you compare them, right? And we came up with 200 companies, publicly held companies, and we divide them into peer groups. And then we said, which companies are doing better than their peer group on average for 2006 to 2013 or 2009 to 2013, two important periods because 2006 represented the recession, 2009 represents the recovery. Of 200 companies, only 19 made that list. It's a sad statement about the industry. And then I said, okay, they made it in performance, so how many companies actually drove improvement? And we started on the process of building the supply chain index, which is a measurement of improvement on the orbit chart, which looks at year over year improvement. And basically we build orbit charts that allowed us to contrast growth and return on invested capital and look at the vector analysis. And that is called the balance factor. And then we charted operating margin and inventory turns and we looked at the vector analysis. And that is called strength. And then we looked at resiliency, or what is the tightness of the pattern at the intersection of operating margin and inventory turns. And we mined the data against the effective frontier. We took all the financial metrics and we put them into groups. And we said, let's find the patterns at revenue, growth, operating margin, inventory turns, and return on invested capital. And then let's look at the impact of the factors so how is an industry done at the intersection of growth and return on invested capital? And that's the growth factor. And how is an industry done at the intersection of operating margin and inventory turns? And that's the strength factor. And how reliable were the results, which is the resiliency factor? What surprised me in the research is the companies that had it the worst, 
the greatest demand and supply volatility did the best. The companies that had it the easiest with the really high margins did it the worst. So our lesson is when the gets tough in supply chain, the tough get going and it matters. So for each of the industries and each of the companies, we calculated the balance factor, the strength factor, and the resiliency factor, and then we weighted them equally. And this is what it looked like across the industries. Essentially, growth has been problematic as we look at the global economy. So the larger the balance factor, the better it is for the company because they're driving improvement at the intersection of growth and resiliency at our return on invested capital. Strength, the larger the number, the better, because it's saying they're making progress at operating margin and inventory turns. And resiliency, you want a small number. So if you step back and you look at this, almost every industry has had their troubles around growth and the global economy and complexity. Almost every industry has become more resilient, which I think is the impact of technology. But the tougher nut to crack is the mental model, to be able to adapt the processes in this changing environment, to be able to go outside in, and to be able to look at how do we drive resiliency and how do industries change, right? So when we look at the pattern of operating margin and inventory turns, the medical device industry is very resilient, but they're not strong. They're not driving improvement. Consumer packaged goods are next in terms of resiliency, and they're strong. But when you look at this chart, communications equipment, consumer electronics have the toughest time on resiliency, but they actually make it to the top of the supply chains that admire, because planning matters there. Horizontal processes matter, end-to-end -end processes matter, business networks matter. When the tough happens and it going gets tough, supply chain leaders make it happen. So one of the challenges I have for you, because the third fallacy is this fallacy of best practices. The first was we'll get there through vertical silos. The second is we're going to get there through projects. The third is this concept that we have these best practices. Maybe we'll open up a box of software. We'll call a busload of consultants. But I don't think we have best practices. I think we have emerging practices. And I think it's up to leaders like you to forge ahead about what these look like and imagine the future. Because I think together we can do that. We can say we need to redefine the organization outside in isn't it a shame that the supply chain became a function? And we can drive alignment because we see that the best inventory turns happen when there is alignment between sales and operations. And we can redefine planning to be a much more holistic, robust process. I'm always amazed at how few companies actually design their supply chains. I was a chemical engineer and spent Three years designing factories, but so few companies design their supply chains. It is really critical. And this clear operating strategy, it's about leadership. And it's about balance. So what we're trying to do is to take the data that we have built in our research and use it as an objective function so that we can connect the quantitative studies we're doing to look at which practices matter. So in this particular case, we've taken quantitative surveys on balance and sales and operations planning, and we've looked at how do organizations rate their alignment, and then we've looked at the balance factors and the strength factors and the impact on inventory turns, and you can see that companies that are better aligned with a small gap between commercial and operations do better at inventory, 10% better turns. And then we're doing analysis about, does organization design matter? So when we look at companies that have manufacturing and sourcing and distribution reporting to the same company hierarchy through the same functional hierarchy, they're more resilient. It's a much tighter, much more reliable pattern. You see fewer swings in the data. 
it's this kind of research we're trying to bring to you. Because I think that you're a lot like this guy on the moving sidewalk. You're a lot like that average Joe. Sitting at the intersection of operating margin and inventory turns and cost, not able to get to data, trying to make things better. But I want you to pull up to the balance sheet. I want you to have a new discussion. I want you to learn what can happen through new technologies. And that is our mission at this conference. I've set up the conference so Laura Tyson's going to help you with what's happening in the global economies so we can really get at that balance factor. She's going to let you ask her questions about what's happening in the economic spectrum of the world. And then we're going to have a series of case studies. I have leaders that are going to talk about how the supply chain index pertains to them and how they manage metrics or haven't managed metrics so well as a system. And then we're going to talk about the ethical supply chain and how we, at the core, make this about the environment and about doing things right. And then we're going to explore the world of the digital supply chain. Mitch Free is going to talk about the redesign of MRO supply chains through digital printing and really challenge us to think about the atoms in the supply chain. And then we're going to talk about new forms of analytics, supply chains that can learn, supply chains that are outside in, supply chains that use cognitive learning, that use artificial intelligence, that use sensing capabilities to really be able to drive higher levels of activity, concurrent optimization. And we're going to talk about probably the biggest broken link in the supply chain, which is you, which is talent. And then we're going to get together and talk and connect at the reception. And then tomorrow we start all over again with robotics and manless vehicles and digital printing at Logitech. And we're going to talk about the collaborative economy and the sharing economy and how that could change the face of Africa as we redesign channels. Then we'll shift gears and we'll talk about how we do things right for the planet, corporate social responsibility, whether it's the design of products or whether it's working with government. And then we're going to talk about value networks, how we automate operating theaters and hospitals and how we really use value networks for sensing. And at the end of the day, I hope you think about things differently. Because most people are, are like average Joe. They're on this moving sidewalk, and I know you've been on many of them in airports, right? If you stand beside the moving sidewalk, you don't go as fast. But if you're on the moving sidewalk, you go really fast. But are you going in the right direction? And do you know where you're headed? Because I find often when I go in and I talk about the methodology, people kind of scratch their heads because it's a new way of looking at it, looking at time phase data. Because I don't want you to be stuck on this moving sidewalk like the average Joe, believing in functional silos or project orientation or not dealing with the supply chain as a complex system. I want to free your thinking. It's for that reason that I invested two years of research in the supply chains to admire. 15 supply chains that we'll talk about today. And then we're going to talk about the definition of supply chain excellence and the number of panels to really challenge you about leadership, complexity, and what the journey looks like. Next year, we'll come back together, same place, same time. Love this venue. Love everyone in the audience. And along the journey, the Supply Chain Insights team is here to help you. I'm hoping next year it's a little bigger. And we're here to help you to think about things differently. And I want to thank the sponsors, because without the sponsors, we wouldn't be here. And spend time with them. Challenge them, right? Yesterday, there was a conversation about the first-generation best-of-breed technology vendors and about how they need to step up the plate and really help us to get unstuck. Tell them that directly. Don't depend upon me and my blog to tell them. And then there's a discussion about SAP HANA tomorrow, or this afternoon, about we can't just rewrite SAP APO on HANA and expect great things to happen. Tell them that directly. And so talk to the consultants. So it's a great group of pioneers here. Spend time. At the end, if you want your own financial benchmarking, fill out the form and hand it to Regina or the reception desk. 
We think about things differently. It's time to imagine. And our artist over here will be capturing it all so that you'll have something to go back with. We're actually going to take this into time-lapse photography so you can share this with the people back at home. And we're videotaping this and we're sharing it for others to see and it will be archived. So with that, let's shift gears.